Hi, so next up we have two speakers, Ranjit and Lindsay from GSK, and they will be talking about how science leads, or yeah, science leads technology at their company. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's great seeing all of you out here. Uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Ranjit Varganath. I'm the director of Big Data Solutions at GlaxoSmithKline. As a part of my role, I lead a group of architects, engineers, and DevOps professionals. Our primary remit is to enable the data and analytics infrastructure and tooling for the pharma R&D business. There have been a lot of items as it relates to GSK and data and analytics in the press lately. We just won Rookie of the Year at Strata. There have been articles coming out about how GlaxoSmithKline is leveraging artificial intelligence machine learning in the drug discovery process. In fact, we're also using this as a way for us to get a little bit more ammunition in terms of talent into the pool. The last article that I saw was on CNBC and was named something along the lines of pharma companies hiring talent from large tech companies such as Google, LinkedIn, uh, and the Facebooks of the world. So there, there is a revolution happening in that sense. I speak on behalf of my colleagues when I say that we're deeply humbled by the recognition that we're getting along with the validation, but what makes us truly unique is our commitment to the patient. We at GSK help millions of people do more, feel better, and live longer. We're a global company that's focused on three verticals, vaccines, consumer healthcare, and pharmacy. And our intent is to help lower the burden and the impact of diseases. And quite simply put, we want to enable the lives, we want to enable others to feel better about their lives through innovative products that we put out. Today's talk, Lindsay and I both will run you through a set of assets that we've produced that stays true to that commitment and that mission. Our goal here is to set the stage with what the business drivers really were, then kind of pull in the technology uh, strategy that enable that. And then we'll kind of dive into and showcase a product that we call Edge Node On Demand and its impact and its operations and what it means. Uh, hopefully throughout the talk, you'll be able to hear a symbolism or, or a thread of how an agile platform enables drug discovery and development. So with that, Lindsay. Thank you, Rajiv. Hi, everybody. My name is Lindsay Edwards. Um, so I'm the head of respiratory data sciences at GlaxoSmithKline. Um, my job is to try and find ways that we can use data and data science to support the drug discovery pipeline uh, with a particular interest in respiratory diseases like asthma and COPD. Um, so if you're new to drug discovery, you might be thinking that it's just going to be radically changed overnight by data science in the way that so many businesses have been disrupted. And um, I fundamentally believe that that will happen, but it isn't going to be easy. And um, the reason it isn't going to be easy is because drug discovery is incredibly hard. I heard it said recently that if you think drug discovery is easy, you've never done drug discovery. Um, at the moment, around about 3% of the molecules that are first given to humans actually end up being medicines it would be fair enough to ask why, as a, as, a, as a community, our hit rate is so low. So we know that one of the reasons is that about half of those medicines will fail due to a lack of efficacy, by which I mean that even though the molecule does what we designed it to do, so it will hit the biological target that we're aiming for, it still won't reverse or treat the disease or slow the progress of the disease. So why is that? The most simple explanation is biology, and human biology in particular, is insanely complicated. Uh, we are the apex of 3.8 billion years of evolution, and um, evolution is not a tidy process. Our brains are probably the most complicated thing on the planet, probably in the galaxy. Depending on whether you believe in extraterrestrial intelligence, they're going to be the most complex thing in the known universe. Um, so just to give you an idea of that complexity, and the point of this is also just to try and give you a window into the drug discovery process. Consider a single cell. 
So a single cell, those are red blood cells, is the building block of life. We still don't really understand how they work. So now if you take those and you think that your lungs are comprised of 60 different cell types, each with different functions, each interacting with each other, those 60 different cell types come together into tissues, those tissues build beautifully complex and delicate structures that allow gas to pass into your blood and from the blood back into the air. And believe it or not, you have 40 square meters of surface area packed into your thoracic cavity on average. And even though you have 40 square meters of this incredibly delicate structure, your lungs will almost never bleed. And that's one organ. You know, you have other organs put together into a human being. So the complexity cannot be understated. And that's why trying to predict what one of these molecules will do when it goes into a human is one of the hardest jobs we as scientists face. But the rewards, the human rewards, are huge. So take, for example, a disease like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. So IPF has an incidence in the developed world of around one in 100,000. So chances are someone you know knows someone with IPF. It's a relatively rare disease, but actually it's on the rise all over the world. IPF is a horrible, horrible illness. It's caused by runaway scarring, destroying that incredibly delicate fabric of the lung. So IPF patients literally suffocate. And the natural history of the disease, your prognosis is still around about two to three years. Believe it or not, a couple of years ago, as, as recently as a couple of years ago, if you went to the doctor with an IPF diagnosis, there was nothing that could be done for you. So now, thank goodness, there are a couple of marketed drugs, but there is still a huge amount of work to be done. And IPF is one of the major respiratory diseases that we work on at GSK Respiratory. And it's that human story, like Ranjith referenced, plus the fact that I just kind of love data are the things that get me out of bed in the morning. So where do containers fit into all of this? Um, so because of the difficulty and because of the complexity and because this is a very new field, my team is focused on trying a lot of new stuff. We love to try new things out. Uh, a lot of those new things we want to try are, are just kind of appearing out of the open source and data science community. They are not even close to being enterprise ready. Um, and so what we need is an environment where we can play safely, try a lot of this new stuff out. Um, and actually the scope of what we do as well is pretty broad. So we might be building visualizations, we'll be putting together machine learning pipelines that might need GPU or CPU acceleration. We are slicing and dicing and joining and filtering large and small data sets, all of which require different computational footprints. And, and that's where edge node on demand comes in. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So in a minute, um, after Ranjith has taken you through some of the more technical details, we'll show you a little video uh, where you'll see somebody provisioning an edge node on demand. You'll see them installing R and R Studio, which are kind of standard tools for a data scientist. And, and I just want to kind of um, go back to this idea that for us, this is a huge enabler. So particularly with some of these bespoke tools, it takes a long time to get them working. If I want to share that work with a colleague, they have to get that stuff working too. And then anybody else that wants to use that, that method needs to get it going as well. So by using a containerized solution, one of us is able to build something to get it working, to run some analysis. A colleague can easily duplicate that analysis. And better still, if they then want to use that method, they can just pick the container up and use it straight off the shelf. So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand back to Ranjith now, and he's going to take you through some of the technical stuff. Thanks, Lindsay. So the call to action was fairly clear. Our user community needed uh, a technology set or a platform that was fairly agile. And they needed to do this because their business was rapidly changing. But before I get into the details of how effectively we enabled Edge Node on Demand, let me do a little bit of scene setting. Let me take you back to circa 2015 at GlaxoSmithKline and kind of how the data ecosystem looked. On the left-hand side, you see the, the classic operational systems of the world. That's where data gets produced. That's where data gets edited. It's used for what we call the primary case for data. So in this case, you can think of a simple example of, I would like to go through and file for a new drug. OK, well, there's a system there that you need to leverage. Data is our product with an R&D, if you think about it, because we pass it over to manufacturing for them to actually build the product. So what we're doing is we're developing dosage amounts. So it becomes key. And so we know how to handle that world really well. The second thing is because we're in a highly regulated business, 
it has to be archived. And that's driven through legal compliance needs so that we can replicate the results at any point in time. But there's a big opportunity that we left on the table, right? Which had to do with the secondary use of data. Now, some of you may sit in the room and say, well, what is that? I mean, you've already filed for a new drug. What does that look like? But this is kind of closing the loop for us, so to speak. So if we take a whole bunch of clinical trials together and analyze it, particularly for patient diversity, we can then influence how the next set of trials are run so that we progressively and incrementally deliver a better product to our end, cons end customers. So that's the value that we saw, and we wanted to seize it. And so the opportunity really in terms of goals were two parts. One was in order to truly do this, we needed to ingest all the data within R&D. That's both structured and unstructured. And then to, in order to do that, I mean, like many of you know, you have to actually go through, scavenge the environment, almost like an archaeology project, figure out where the data actually is, develop pipelines at scale, and then pull them in. The second is R&D is a fairly nimble organization. I mean, people fairly read papers, and they're like, well, we want to try something new. So we needed to support a multitude of tools and technologies and interfaces so that they can actually run the analysis at scale. And then not to mention the curation activity that actually brought it all together to formulate these information assets. So what did we do? We built something called the R&D Information Platform. This was more of an ecosystem. So we took a whole bunch of hardware, software components, put it together, and we enabled just foundational capabilities that would get us up and running to do a few things, right? Acquire data, curate data, analyze data, visualize data. And as we did that, I think we, we went through and we categorized it in 10 clusters because effectively as we started looking at the landscape of the amount of use cases that we had, we broadly classified it into three cases. One was classic dashboarding, hindsight level analytics, which is let me get my data in, curate it, have reports running, and then people are happy, right? Your production SLAs are typically running from there. The next set of use cases are about bringing your own data. So this is, this is something where you have an analysis to run because someone calls you and says, hey, tell me what this would look like, and maybe you don't need to repeat it again and again, so you need that scale, that burst capability. So you go through, bring your data in, munge it how you need to, and then you, you go away with the insight. You leave the data where it is. The third was what we call validated processes. These are effectively a highly rigorous process that we need to provide a lot of documentation, a lot of capabilities around it to make sure that we're producing the results accurately so that we can file for, for drugs. And so classically, these were the three kind of buckets that we fit all the use cases in. So we developed a platform that would help meet the goals of those three broad brushstroke needs. So what we ended up was with 10 clusters, about 700 nodes. And we, we did a fairly good job with it, you know, but as we were doing this and we were implementing these new tools and technologies, we started to understand how to integrate these tools better. Uh, but then we saw a gap in the market. There was nobody kind of doing that. And what we felt we needed, to, we needed to do was integrate it so that our users could have a better experience. So effectively, we started to go on a journey. And this journey had to do more with the fact that the team and the expectations of the users really were changing from saying, hey, give me access to this tool to give me access to this capability. So how do we enable that user experience to a point where it works seamlessly, it integrates across all these different tools, almost creating like an operating system for analytics? And that's really where the story of Docker comes into play for us. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger part that we looked at was when we scavenged the environment and said, okay, well, what's that first level feature that we're gonna enable? It became evident that the whole aspect of having something on demand being spun up with some of the prepackaged configurations, along with an enabled user, is kind of where things landed. And just to kind of give you an idea of why that was such a huge pain point, I want to take you through a workflow here that kind of clearly indicates that it takes us about three to six months, right, to get a new tool and technology enabled. And to Lindsay's point, many of these, many of these frameworks are rapidly changing. So we are on our heels most of the time, and oh, by the, by the way, by the time we implement something in six months, the need may have already gone, so there was an opportunity that we lost. 
Yeah, and, and actually very quickly, so that, to that point, Ranjit, so th this process is absolutely appropriate process for provisioning new software for the enterprise, but absolutely doesn't work for the type of thing that we do. So if, if we want to spin something up really, really fast, test it fast, see whether it's fit for purpose and kill it, this is, is not the way to go, so. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you. In fact, this is the kind of challenging that our business partners do all the time. And so we said, okay, well, how do we think about this problem differently? And that's when we came up with this concept of edge node on demand. And for us, what it is, is it's really a lens into our 10 clusters. So the way that I explain this is imagine that you have an apartment in Manhattan and you want to go to LA one day. That business process would involve you packing everything, getting all the logistics figured out, driving to LA, or maybe you fly, unpacking everything, and then getting into your apartment. Everything from the point that you made the decision to move to being in your apartment in LA was time wasted, right? It's just the process of doing things. So effectively for us, we have what we call 10 clusters and they're like different continents, so to speak. And so we needed one set of a node, an edge, so to speak, that we can just move into these different places. And the benefit for us was we didn't want to lose any work as we did that. The end users wouldn't let us do that, right? I mean, if they've already done and performed a set of work within those nodes, they would want to keep it and just kind of move it between these different clusters. One may ask, well, what is the real use case for even moving it between these different clusters? That's a good question. I mean, effectively, we have a dev test prod environment and we've got these three segments of clusters like I talked about. So when the user is ready, they can best make the determination to move it up, but then the volume in prod is not the same as in dev. So they make a determination of when to move it and they keep their code base with them. They keep all the dependencies that they built up. And that's really the power of kind of going through and doing this, which is a capability that we call edge node on demand. Now here's the architecture, right? What did we really use in order to enable this capability? I already talked about Hadoop being kind of like the heart of the ecosystem for us. That's where we store a lot of the data. We're using Clutter distribution for Hadoop, which is what you see on your right, left-hand side. And effectively what we do is we utilize MongoDB to store our metadata. And then we use Docker to spin up these edge nodes. And we orchestrate all of this through a UI, which is Angular-based. So what we do is as soon as you spin it up, we persist the metadata in Mongo. That way we know exactly which container is running where, who has it been provisioned to, what's the ID, how many of them are running at a given point in time. The other is we actually use Ansible to orchestrate this because we have a set of tasks that have been defined. Start, stop, move, turn down, shut down. So I mean there are these different activities that we've defined and it's a playbook that we run. And then we go through and use DTR and UCP to A, do the authentication, but also to pull the image down and kind of get it to run. I'm going to use this architecture to run you through a demo scenario that we're going to showcase here in a minute. But let's just take this simple example of enabling a tool like an RStudio or an RConnect, which is very, very favored within the data science community typically. And so what we do is we utilize our infrastructure to spin up a node have the user actually go through and do the installation and the, and the packages that they need, by the way, to go through and enable it. And then allow them to share that infrastructure, right? So now you have an enabled user. Now, their enablement is not at the cost of enterprise integrations, and that was a big key that, that we wanted to provide is, can we integrate with Active Directory? Can we have an authentication module that's centralized, that, that is being leveraged by the entire infrastructure? Yes. Can we integrate it to a point where that they keep their files and they can move it wherever they need to by integrating it with like enterprise standards of home directories? Yes. So those are all the things that you see listed up there as enterprise integrations. But the biggest one that I always go back to is this aspect of mobility, right? I mean, in, in the US we think of cars as a euphemism for freedom. So to me, this is almost like a euphemism for freedom as it relates to analytics. It, it, it's an enabled user who can share the work and we leverage that and harness that innovation much and tying it back to the overall goal that we have at GSK, specifically at R&D, data is our product. So the quicker we get to that level of innovation, the better off we are. So with that, let me actually run you through the demo.
So as we said before, this is just going to take you through a typical provisioning of an edge node. So um, this is one of the team just logging in through our standard portal. And this is the front end. And it's really straightforward. So you literally select the computational infrastructure that you want to start with. Obviously, you can change it later. These are the standard tools that you get when you sign up for an edge node. And this is where you can share with other users. So we would be able to provision a node share with other people in the team. As you'll see later, the only person with elevated um, privileges is the provisioner, so it's, it's, it's not a free-for-all. Um, and it, it really is quick. We have some terms and conditions around the data and the platform that you need to agree to before you provision. There's a little bit of confirmation. And there you go. In seconds. Yeah. So now we have um, our own edge node that we can shell into. So you see here, this is just using Putty to shell into it from Windows. Um, and what you'll see here is the provisioner uh, can see the Hadoop file system. So he's got access to HDFS. And then also that the provisioner has sufficiently elevated privileges to be able to install R. So it's a, for those of you who aren't data scientists, it's a statistical programming language. One of the big things to note here is the fact that we used to have a shared infrastructure where we would allow users to log in. So we took away elevated privileges. With this, we give it back to the user because we're able to isolate them effectively. So then you can see somebody also installing our studio, which is a GUI front end for R. It's really incredibly straightforward. The, the other part to notice here is this is going through a proxy. So all the authentication is verified. There we go. And then you'll also see once you're in our studio, it's possible to install a, a database connector and again to connect to HDFS from ARM. There you go. So next we're quickly going to show you um, that the shared users then have access to that environment. Uh, they don't have elevated privileges, so they're not able to change things. It's very much down to the provisioner to determine the, um, what lives on that edge node and share it with others. Uh, but they do have access to everything that's been installed there. So the, sh the, um, the shared user should be able to access R, they should be able to access R Studio, and they should be able to access HDFS. Exactly. And we do this more from a compliance perspective to make sure that, you know, that multiple users aren't, aren't competing with each other with elevated privileges. But I think also you'd want, once you have a, a node provisioned, you'd want it to stay the same. You wouldn't, anybody else that logs into it wouldn't be able to change it. Yeah, so you're right. So it's more along the lines of stability, yeah. right? Ensuring that we can provision that. So you see the shared user logging into our studio. And again, although these are fairly standard tools, you can imagine this applies to pretty much anything that we want to put in there. And one of the things to note here, right, is the fact that you don't see a whole set of instructions when that library came up because he's reusing something that he already had access to because it moves with him. So this is the other thing that, that uh, Ranjith was talking about, the ability to change the infrastructure in the back end. So in a fairly transparent way, we can then go back into the GUI change the computational infrastructure that sits behind. And, and again, that's completely transparent to us and to the processes that run in the container. So effectively, at this point, the user has made a determination that they're ready to move from dev to prod because they're going to run it on a larger data set. Yeah. And they don't contact anybody. It's done automatically in the background for them. And boom, a notification gets sent out. Seconds later, you're able to verify that it's finished because it's all being seen in a UI. And now you're able to log in. But when you log in, and this is the key part, the URL stays the same. So the configurations that you have are exactly the same. You're not changing the host name. You're not changing the port number. Everything is handled for you in the background. Yep. And as Ranji said, you can still see the file system. There we go. But now the back end service is different. I mean, this also highlights the fact that the cluster is different, and that's one of the things that they're showcasing here. In addition to the fact that it's another user, right, that's logged in.
all the pre-configured software and dependencies stay intact. So whatever they had in dev, they moved it up. Now they're in prod, they can leverage it. I think we can probably just, everyone's seeing, is that okay? Yeah, so this is just showing that you have access to different, you know, different data structures. Well, one of the other aspects about this is, is that we're leveraging all the metadata from an administration perspective to make sure that we can see where the containers are running, who's been assigned to what, what's the state of it. And then we utilize this almost to make sure that we can manage the workload on all of our worker nodes. And that's important. that was important for our admins as we kind of went into this journey. So I think that was, that was the big piece that we tried to satisfy two users. One was more of the operations aspect of things and the other was the end users like Lindsay and team having to do with more along the lines of the data science aspects. So just some key highlights, right? I mean, this, the, the kind of the journey that we're on is gonna keep increasing, keep increasing and adding ammunition to our UI, but it's one single interface and that's kind of what we wanted to build out. The other aspect of it was we wanted to drive out this aspect of user isolation. Because we're giving root level privileges on a container, how do we effectively isolate that? That way, one's misfortune is theirs alone and not anyone else's. Uh, the other aspect of it was like, how can we share the work that's already been done by a user? If someone's already pulling up and writing code and developing a solution, how can we just reuse that? What does that look like? And then the seamless migration, right? Often you have to file tickets, someone validates it and then says, yeah, you know what, let me go through and move it from one environment to the other. But at this point, we actually put the user right in the middle and we say, you make that determination. And oh, by the way, failure is okay. You just fail fast, but when you do, it's contained to your specific solution. So what does Docker really power? Right? And this is relating back to the architecture diagram that you saw. We're microservices based. A lot of the services that you saw there are all running on Docker. We have our Jenkins engine as well running on Docker. The edge nodes itself with prepackaged libraries are also running on Docker. And then we have some niche cases where we run RDBMSs on Docker like Postgres. This wouldn't have come without any opportunities, so I just wanted to quickly touch base on the three that we looked at. One is data persistency, right? As you're installing different libraries, how can you migrate that from one environment to the other? What does that look like? How do we stay true to the stateless principle? We use NFS to solve that problem. So we have a shared directory that's specific to that user that we migrate up with us. The other part is, well, we started to run into snags associated with performance, right? As we're hitting these large images, we start to notice that our NFS performance needed to specifically be tuned. And I wouldn't, you know, security is always a big concern. So as we're giving elevated privileges in a container, how do we make sure to isolate that? And we solve that by using TempFS because we're using system D within our container. So that was a big one. And then some of our learnings really. I mean, the team was fairly new to Docker. So we dealt a lot with the stability issues and we said, okay, well, how do we fix that? I mean, so we had to iterate through different kernel patches, working with the Docker team effectively, trying to get it up to par. And so we learned along the way, but we failed fast, right? So what are the future things that we see coming out of this project? And for us, it's, it's two parts. One is, as the user makes a determination to move from one environment to the other, today he still, he or she still needs to pick whether it's one cluster or the other because we have like three production clusters. What we want to do is this concept of champion challenge. We want to run it on multiple environments, get the results and make a recommendation to the user to say, hey, your workload is best suited for a GPU cluster versus a CPU cluster. The next thing that we want to do is we, today we're doing that with edge nodes, which is effectively a lens into your cluster. How do we do that with the entire cluster by keeping the data static underneath it? That's another big piece that the team is going to be working on. And the last one has to do with this concept of an app store. So as a user is going through and building these solutions, how do we, how do we leverage that to be positioned in a central location that others can just download and subscribe to it? So that's kind of the viewpoint that we have in terms of the next steps and where the future heads for us as it relates to this product specifically. Now, 
it, it takes a village to put something like this together. So I don't want to go without like, you know, giving some acknowledgements to people. I think we had a lot of great internal partners, the end user infrastructure services team, which is our IT operations organization. Very, very helpful in kind of driving this forward. Obviously, Lindsay and team, you know, there have been a lot of people over in the data science community who have contributed their ideas to this. Uh, there are folks who I represent within the data COE who have worked really, really hard, uh, both from a product management perspective and also from a product development perspective to leverage this. And then we also have a set of external partners who've kind of helped progress this journey for us. So with that, I think, you know, we're at the close of the talk. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, and we're happy to take questions. There are three mics spread across the room, so feel free to grab any of those and, and ask away. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Would you mind using the mic? Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I mean, if you've got 50 people spinning this stuff up, I mean, are you cloud-based or have you got like elastic physical infrastructure just to cope with all this load? Yeah, so it's a very good question. We're all on-prem. We don't have, we do, we don't have uh, cloud presence as it relates to this infrastructure. In fact, that's one of the conversations I was having with the Docker team right now is we're in beta mode. We have a list of five users that we're allowing to spin up. The next set of immediate projects that we're doing is hardware isolation. That way we can actually categorize and say, you know what, you can only have 10 gigs of RAM, right, versus 20. So right now the way that we're throttling it is we're saying, hey, we got five users, we're gonna let each of them spin up two containers on a single machine. And that's the high level throttling that's done on the UI. But we wanna get to a point of hardware isolation. That's our immediate next step. Any more for any more? No? Nope. Okay. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everyone.